Hello everyone. Today I bring you a thrilling German sci-fi series. The show is based on Frank Schätzing's novel The Swarm and features talented actors from popular series like Dark and Babylon Berlin. The story begins with a mystery near Vancouver Island in the North Pacific. Orcas, the ocean's top predators, have started behaving strangely. Whale researcher Leon discovers a dead orca washed up on the shore, covered in bizarre wounds. These whales migrate here yearly, but nothing like this has happened before. The orca's body appears freshly killed, and Leon suspects local fishermen may be involved. Curious, Leon visits the docks to question an old fisherman he knows. The fisherman hesitates, but then shows Leon a damaged fishing boat. He explains that an orca attacked the boat earlier that morning. The creature rammed the vessel aggressively, forcing the fishermen to defend themselves with hooks and knives. This could be the same orca found dead on the beach. Leon and his companions feel speechless. The fishermen only try to protect themselves. But why did the orca attack unprovoked? Elsewhere, another group of fishermen heads out to sea. As they lower their nets, one man pulls on what he thinks is a heavy catch. Suddenly, a mysterious force yanks him into the water. He surfaces briefly, gasping for air, then dives down. Underwater, he notices the surrounding fish acting strangely as if something is wrong. Sensing imminent danger, he tries to escape, but the dense school of fish blocks his way. After a struggle, the sea grows still and the man vanishes, leaving only his empty canoe drifting on the surface. Meanwhile, Charlie, a marine station worker in Scotland, is out on a small boat. She has lost contact with an underwater detector and goes to check on it. Diving into the water, she finds the device caught in a drifting fishing net. As she works to free it, eerie noises echo from the deep, filling her with dread. Charlie finally breaks the net apart, retrieves the detector, and swims back to her boat. She secures the device to a buoy and rushes aboard, shaken by her unsettling experience. Charlie and her colleague Thomas inspect the damaged underwater detector. They discover that the insulation material on the circuit has melted. Thinking it was an accident, they replace the circuit board. Charlie and Douglas return to the sea the next day to redeploy the repaired device. Douglas notices a strange white object floating on the water as they finish. Charlie pulls it up and shocks Douglas by asking for a lighter to ignite it. The object is methane hydrate, or fire ice, made from decomposed algae and typically found deep on the ocean floor. It rarely rises to the surface. To their surprise, they realize the entire area is covered with this fire ice. Charlie immediately records videos and informs her superiors, suspecting a major eruption of hydrate from the seabed. Her superiors ask for the damage detector's data to analyze the cause. Elsewhere, Leon continues monitoring whale sounds after the orca attack on the fishing boats. He listens daily, trying to understand what is happening. One day, he detects a pot of orcas nearby and rushes out. After dropping his monitoring device into the water, a massive whale suddenly surfaces, locking eyes with Leon before diving away. Leon tracks the orcas as they head toward a sightseeing boat filled with tourists. Alarmed, he starts his boat and tries to warn them. Unaware of the danger, the tourists watch excitedly as the whale leaps out of the water, soaking them and expecting more performances. The crew joins in the excitement, not hearing Leon's urgent radio calls, but the thrill turns to terror when the whale breaches again. Chaos erupts. Passengers fall into the water. Leon speeds to rescue them, pulling people onto his boat as the orcas close in. The scene turns horrific as the orcas start attacking the fallen tourists. Leon frantically saves as many as he can, but as he tries to help Lizzie, the tour guide and his friend, she is grabbed by the orcas. Leon watches helplessly as she is dragged into the depths, overwhelmed with grief. A giant lobster is caught by fishermen and sold to a restaurant chef. The chef brings the live lobster to his kitchen to prepare. He sees white liquid leaking from the lobster's underside as he examines it. When he flips it over, the liquid sprays onto his face. Frustrated, he wipes it off and tells his assistant to clean the lobster. The assistant notices the lobster looks ill and hands it to a cleaner for disposal. Unaware of the danger, the cleaner places the lobster in the garbage disposal, but the liquid splashes on her. She brushes it off without much thought. Later that evening, the chef feels sick, sweating, and struggling to breathe. He asks his assistant to continue working and goes outside for air. Meanwhile, the cleaner also becomes unwell, dropping a plate while cleaning. The chef's condition worsens, and he collapses on his way home. By the time he arrives at the hospital, it is too late. His assistant soon faints as well and is rushed to the hospital. In another scene, marine biologist Dr. Sigur arrives by helicopter at an oil exploration ship. 
The crew has found a patch of white worms on the seabed and asks for his expertise. Sigur identifies the creatures as ice worms and asks how long they have spread. The crew explains that the worms initially covered 50 square meters a few days ago, but now span the entire area. Sigur finds this spread alarming and asks if the before and after photos are from the same spot. When the crew confirms this, he grows concerned. The captain questions what the worms are doing there, and Sigor explains. The worms feed on bacterial mats on the sea floor, while the white patches are frozen methane deposits. Suddenly, a loud noise comes from the ocean, and their monitoring equipment loses its signal. It briefly returns, but the staff admits that interference happens often, and the reason remains unknown. Sigor captures an ice worm and examines it under a microscope. He quickly spots abnormalities. Ice worms usually live in the distant northern seas, don't have jaws and are harmless, but these worms have teeth, suggesting they have evolved or mutated into a new species. Even more worrying is their potential to reproduce rapidly. Ice worms can lay billions of eggs, though only a few typically hatch. Yet, these worms have spread across a vast sea area in mere days at an alarming rate far beyond any known species. Sigur reviews the photos from two days ago and notices the ice worms have almost doubled in size since their discovery. After observing them for 24 hours, he discovered the worms feed on bacterial mats and then burrow into the ice. This explains their sharp teeth and large jaws. However, no food is beneath the ice, and the worms suffocate and die after burrowing. The reason behind this self-destructive behavior baffles experts, but they confirm that the worms reproduce faster than any known bacteria. Sigur discusses the issue with Tina, an environmental expert for an oil company. Together, they meet with senior executives. The company's decision to extract oil now hinges on the presence of this new species. Executives argue it's not a big concern since the worms seem to die soon after birth. However, Tina insists on returning to the exploration ship for more research. Meanwhile, Dr. Cecile visits the restaurant and talks to the kitchen staff. She learns that the chef and his assistant may have gotten sick after handling a lobster, and the cleaner who handled it is also missing work. Cecile rushes to the cleaner's home and finds her dead, vomiting black blood. At the hospital, the assistant's condition worsens, his body convulses violently, and despite CPR and medical efforts, he dies on the hospital bed. After the whale incident, Leon heads to the docks to gather more information. He speaks with an old Japanese captain who recounts how his ship's rudder malfunctioned days ago. When two boats came to tow them, two massive shadows appeared below. Suddenly, two humpback whales breached the surface and smashed the tugboat. Leon asks if any calves are nearby, but the captain says no. Leon explains that whales usually attack to defend their young. Leon then inspects the Japanese ship and finds its rudder covered in many muscles. The captain insists the hull was clean when they left Tokyo. Leon picks up the muscles, realizing they are unusually large and not something that should have grown during a typical voyage. On the exploration ship, Sigur observes that the ice worms have grown even more. The team plans to drill beneath the bacterial mats to understand why the worms burrow so deeply. As the drill breaks through the ice, the ship shakes violently and a massive wave rocks the vessel. They immediately stop, fearing further danger. At the lab, Professor Katharina explains that the drill likely breached the seabed, disrupting the pressure control system and releasing crude oil. The ship was big enough to withstand the surge, but a smaller vessel could have been dragged under. After analyzing the ice samples Sigor brought, they found that bacteria had made the ice layer dangerously fragile. The bacteria dig deeper after the worms die, weakening the ice. Katharina tries to reassure the team that even if the ice layer collapses and methane is released, it won't reach the atmosphere and cause a greenhouse effect. This gives the oil company confidence to continue drilling. However, instruments suddenly fail on their scientific observation ship, and chaos ensues. Before anyone can react, violent waves rise, and the sea swallows the vessel as if a giant mouth has opened from below. A young couple joking on a bridge drops a book into the water. Looking down, they are shocked to see giant jellyfish rising from below. More jellyfish appear, and people by the river discuss the bizarre sight. Meanwhile, the port is overrun with jellyfish spreading into the sea. Cecile examines a blood sample from the chef's assistant at the hospital lab. She cuts her finger and drops her blood mixed with the sample. To her horror, the cells in her blood are consumed by a type of bacteria called wound vibrio. Usually, the bacteria only releases toxins when it infects people through wounds or from raw seafood. Human blood typically annihilates vibrio, making severe infections rare. But this vibrio is different. It aggressively devours blood and appears to be a dangerous mutated strain. 
Cecile feels some relief that no new cases have been reported. However, her colleague Sophia brings terrible news. More people have been infected, and none have survived. Meanwhile, Leon and his colleagues study the muscles he took from the Japanese ship's rudder. Dr. Natalia identifies them as zebra mussels, but notes they are twice their average size. Typically, mussels only swarm as larvae, but these have grown unusually fast. The Japanese ship has only been sailing for 18 days from Tokyo, far too short for such rapid growth. Natalia plans to send the mussels to a specialized lab for genetic sequencing to see if they have mutated or are a new species. Leon's colleague Alicia discovers a white liquid leaking from one of the mussels. They decide to test it. Leon suggests doing an autopsy on the orca found on the beach. Despite dying from human weapons, he wants to understand why it attacked fishing boats. During the autopsy, Leon finds a white substance in the whale's brain, indicating something has invaded its tissue. Dr. Natalia thinks it could be mold, but needs to run tests. Meanwhile, in the city, people start falling ill. A car washer suddenly collapses, coughing up black blood. He is rushed to the hospital. Cecile learns that over a dozen people have been infected with the Vibrio. She questions them about eating or touching lobster, but they all deny it. This puzzles her. If the bacteria were airborne, the outbreak would be far worse. Cecile remembers the cleaner who disposed of the lobster in the garbage system. She realizes the bacteria might have spread into the city's water supply. She tries to explain further, but Sophia is too distracted by the influx of sick patients. With panic setting in, Cecile rushes to buy bottled water and warns her family. She tells her husband to take the kids and leave the city, avoiding tap water. Dr. Seeger shares information about the ice worms with Sato, an oil exploration company manager. He hopes they will support further research since the worms have impacted them too. Seeger suggests there is a link between the jellyfish, the whale attacks, and the ice worms. Sato reports this to his boss, Mifune, in a video meeting. Their company has also encountered similar worms while drilling in the South China Sea. Although smaller than those in the Norwegian Sea, these worms have sharp teeth and jaws. Sato believes their missing oil ship could be related to the worms and advises company vessels to steer clear of areas where ice worms are present. Sato informs Sigur that ice worms have appeared in Asia. Realizing the urgency, Sigur warns Tina that these worms may destabilize the methane hydrates faster than expected. He asks her to return to the exploration ship to monitor the worm's spread. Meanwhile, Acilia maps the sites of whale attacks in the Pacific. Leon notices these locations match the whale's annual migration route. He suspects something disrupted the whales during this journey. To investigate, he identifies where the whales rest and dons a wetsuit. Swimming among the sleeping whales, which float like massive monuments, he attaches a small camera to one. The slight movement startles the whales awake, and the whales begin circling Leon's small boat. Leon quickly swims to the surface. He is pulled aboard just in time and escapes, narrowly avoiding their boat being crushed. Leon reviews the camera footage, which shows the whale diving to extreme depths. Suddenly, a loud sound is heard, and a glowing, starry light appears before the whales. Everyone watches, transfixed. The whales stop swimming and start vocalizing as if communicating with an unknown being in the light. At the same time, Charlie's lab receives video footage about the sunken observation ship. Charlie's friend died in the disaster. Reviewing the footage, they notice glowing objects floating around the ship. Charlie and her team watch closely, trying to understand what caused the sudden catastrophe. A young couple enjoys a romantic moment on a beach in the East Cape of South Africa when a white crab suddenly climbs onto the girl's thigh. They laugh it off initially, but then panic as countless crabs crawl out of the sea, swarming toward them. They jump onto their motorcycle to escape, but the crabs overtake the village. Leon continues analyzing the footage from the camera. The glowing light and unfamiliar sounds recorded are unlike anything known. Bioluminescent algae light up only at the surface, not at the depths shown. The sounds resemble whale calls, but aren't any Leon recognizes. His partner Jack suggests it could be a secret military experiment. Cecile and Sophia report the bacterial outbreak to the authorities. They explain that the bacteria mainly spread through contaminated food and water, but person-to-person -person transmission isn't ruled out. Thankfully, it does not spread through the air. The problem is no effective treatment exists. Cecile urges citizens to avoid drinking unboiled or non-bottled water and to halt all fishing along the Atlantic coast. Officials push back concerning the economic impact and accuse Cecile of exaggerating. Cecile insists this strain is the deadliest she's ever studied. If it continues contaminating the water, the consequences will be devastating. Cecile watches the news, which reports that warming sea temperatures have triggered mass crab landings worldwide. 
The invasions are increasing, and such large-scale events have never occurred before. Meanwhile, Seeger and Tina, taking ship, return to the ocean floor they have drilled. They find an area stripped of vegetation, clearly damaged by human machinery. Tina is shocked, stating the company's permits only cover oil, gas, and methane extraction, not excavation. Sigur seeks answers from Professor Katharina, who reveals that a hidden clause in the license allows seabed excavation for pipeline preparation. This clause uses the same equipment as digging continental slope sediments. Katharina warns that if Sigur exposes this, the company could blame Tina, his ex-girlfriend. She advises him to think carefully and talk to Tina before moving. Dr. Natalia discovers that identical large muscles, sharing the same genetic barcode, have appeared in three ports worldwide. Alicia points out that it is unlikely that a new species can appear in multiple places simultaneously. Natalia also finds that the clumps from the whale's brain and the white liquid from the mussels contain the same organic compounds. However, the substance in mussels from the Barrier Queen oil tanker decomposes quickly in the air, making further testing difficult. She needs more samples. Leon returns to the port, but finds it sealed off by security. Under the cover of night, he sneaks over the wall to reach the Barrier Queen in search of more muscles, but gets caught and arrested. The next day, Leon meets the dock manager, who sets up a video call with Sato. Leon explains he was trying to collect more muscle samples, as they have unique features and contain an unknown, unstable substance that decomposes rapidly. He insists it's a new species, pointing out that although the mussels came from Tokyo, they have also been found in other seas. Sato listens carefully, exchanging a look with his assistant, and asks for the locations of the mussel sightings before releasing Leon. But afterward, Sato contacts Mifune to discuss the issue. The emergence of ice worms and mutated mussels threatens global shipping, and it seems more than a coincidence. Leon leaves the dock with boxes of the mussels. Charlie and her boyfriend return to the lighthouse. Charlie finds a video on her computer sent by her friend Jess before her ship sank. Grief overwhelms her, but then she notices something strange in the footage. A glowing light appears outside the ship's window behind Jess. Charlie wonders if this mysterious light caused the disaster. People in protective suits bring boxes labeled with hazardous chemicals to the hospital lab, but they only contain frozen crabs. These crabs are part of the marine invasion on land. Cecile, wearing protective gear, opens one crab and finds a white sticky liquid inside. Using a pipette, she examines it under a microscope mixed with human blood. To her horror, the liquid contains the deadly wound Vibrio bacteria, which is 100% fatal. Cecile realizes the danger. These crabs appear worldwide, and the bacteria could spell disaster for humanity. In the lighthouse, Charlie observes the video her friend Jess sent. She notices the strange light display is accompanied by an unusual sound. When she compares it with the sound from the underwater detector footage, she discovers they share identical frequencies. Charlie urgently shares this with Profar Katharina and Sigor, believing the sound is linked to the shipwreck. She wants to use an advanced underwater robot for further investigation. Sigor sees news about marine life invading the land and learns that the International Ocean Protection Council has called an emergency meeting meeting in Geneva, expecting experts from around the world. He contacts Sato and desires to attend, believing the ice worms, jellyfish, and infected sea creatures are connected. Sato recalls Leon's discovery of rapidly reproducing mussels, disrupting shipping, and agrees to connect them. Sigur soon calls Leon, and they share their findings. Leon mentions an organic substance in the mussels and the whale's brainstem. Tests show it contains over 100 molecular compounds common in mammals and bivalves, possibly altering the behavior of marine life. Despite his expertise, Leon is unsure of the cause, but agrees to send the data to Sigur. At home, Sigur finds Tina waiting for him. She has resigned from her job, feeling guilty about the company's environmental damage and secrecy. Tina needs time to process everything. As she prepares to leave, Sigur musters the courage to ask for another chance with her. But after a moment, Tina simply says goodbye and walks away. The next day, Seeger receives data from Leon and watches the footage from the camera attached to the whale. He is stunned to see the light display respond to the whale's calls with a strange rustling sound. Seeger sends the video to the lab, but the researchers can't identify the light display. They notice, however, that the sound matches the one in the shipwreck video sent from Charlie. Sigur then learns that Professor Katharina plans to send a deep-sea robot via helicopter to Charlie at the lighthouse. He asks to join the flight to see her. When he meets Charlie, 
He asks her to share the robot's findings as soon as possible. Then, he gets an urgent call from Katharina to say that a tsunami is headed for the coast and asks him to get to higher ground immediately. Meanwhile, Tina waits on another beach for her new boyfriend, a chef, to finish work. She suddenly sees seabirds fleeing inland, chased by an unseen threat. The ocean pulls back, revealing the sand, a clear sign of an incoming tsunami. Tina runs to the parking lot but finds her boyfriend in his car. She shouts for him to wait, but he leaves her behind. Desperate, Tina gets into her car, but realizes it's too late to escape. Thinking of Sigur, she tries to call him, but it goes to voicemail. She leaves a final message, expressing regret for not staying with him. Tears fall as she watches the towering wave crash over. On the other side, Sigur, hearing Katharina's warning, tells the helicopter to stop and manages to find Charlie. He pulls her aboard, and they narrowly escape the tsunami. They watch the massive wave from the sky destroy Charlie's lighthouse, leaving only ruins behind. The infected crabs first landed in Japan and quickly spread to coasts in South Africa, Brazil, and beyond. The bacteria they carry contaminates all water sources, both natural and man-made. With 40% of the world's population living in coastal areas, this invasion could cause the largest displacement of people in history. The bacteria seem to have been brought to shore by an unknown species designed solely to infect humans. World leaders express alarm, questioning Cecile about whether the crabs are intentionally contaminating water. Cecile replies that the data indicates this possibility. Sigur sees the report on TV and asks Sato to connect him with Cecile. During their call, Cecile shares her growing fears. She explains that infected marine life seems to be adapting. Initially, lobsters carrying bacteria were brought ashore by fishermen. Now, crabs are coming onto land by themselves, which deeply worries her. Leon speaks with local fishermen about moving inland. He worries about their safety, but an old man who has lived by the sea his whole life resists the idea. Many coastal residents feel the same, tied to the ocean despite the risks. Sigur gathers Leon, Cecile, Professor Katharina, and others with Sato's help. He argues that recent marine events defy biology. The whale's erratic behavior, the infected crustaceans, and the mutated bacteria all point to a force weaponizing the ocean against humanity. Cecile thinks the ocean is responding to years of human harm. Katharina dismisses this idea as too far-fetched and leaves the discussion. Sigur decides they must reveal their suspicions. He believes the marine disasters are interconnected and intentional, aimed at making coastlines uninhabitable and driving humans away. He emphasizes that the threat may not be alien, but the intelligence behind these events surpasses anything humanity knows. The transformations of these organisms go beyond current technology. Sigur names this entity YRR, signaling a new and intelligent adversary from the sea. Sigur's warnings fail to convince the others at the meeting. Instead, they accuse him of alarmism and refuse to fund his research. Meanwhile, Leon meets linguist Samantha. She analyzes the sounds from the light display and finds that similar waves have been recorded in Earth's polar regions. Samantha begins verifying with global colleagues to see if these sounds have appeared elsewhere. At Leon's invitation, she joins their team. While Sigur worries about research funding, Mifune contacts him through Sato. Mifune has seen Sigur's presentation and is convinced. Mifune feels it is time to give back, having significantly profited from the oceans. He offers Sigur the necessary funds and ships. Sigur gathers the six remaining team members. Their seven-person crew will set sail in 48 hours for the dangerous mission, and everyone says goodbye to their families. Alone in his room, Sigur listens repeatedly to Tina's last message, mourning her loss. He is determined to find the truth for her. Scientists have confirmed that genetically modified marine organisms are attacking coastlines worldwide, likely directed by an unknown intelligent life form. A team of top marine biologists, linguists, medical experts, and geologists prepares to investigate. Their goal is to understand why this entity is targeting humanity. Sigur has named this life form YRR, and they must locate it to learn its intentions. Experts on the ship listen to sounds from the underwater detector, realizing they are strongest in the Arctic and Antarctic. Like any evolved marine species, Sigur suggests that YRR likely has breeding grounds in these regions. Leon adds that such organisms live at depths of 5,000 to 5,500 meters to survive. Charlie highlights areas of Arctic melting, focusing on the Maloy Deep, which is 5,500 meters deep and heavily signals YRR activity. Mifune has sent a reporter, Elena, to document the mission. He wants their findings updated daily since this mission could become a historic event. As they set sail, Elena interviews the crew. Linguist Samantha reveals her plan to try communicating with YRR. 
Since YRR emits sound waves, she intends to send modified sounds back. This could provoke a response, but also risk triggering an attack. Samantha uses several YR sound signals and adds a recording of a crying human baby to show that humans are capable of unique signals, not just mimicry. If YR replies differently, it would mean they understood. Meanwhile, Cecile and Sigur analyze infected marine organisms, discovering that YR elevates glutamate levels in nerve cells. This makes the organisms behave like a controlled army, obeying YR commands. Upon reaching the Arctic, Luther and Charlie pilot a small underwater vessel into the depths. The research ship broadcasts Samantha's modified sounds. Soon, the radar picks up something unusual. Leon detects a new sound that interferes with the ship's equipment. Suddenly, contact with the exploration vessel is lost, and sonar indicates a mass of unknown objects approaching. The captain urgently recalls the vessel and orders the broadcast to stop. However, the mysterious sound continues, even after stopping broadcasting. Luther and Charlie sense something is wrong in the small underwater vessel when communication isn't restored. They use thrusters to return to the surface and finally re-establish contact as they near the main ship. Just as they are about to board, Charlie sees a glowing light in the water, emitting the sound they had heard. The underwater vessel safely returns to the primary research ship. Samantha analyzes the sounds and discovers that, while the overall frequency remains unchanged, the sound of the human baby crying has been altered. This confirms that YRR understood and responded to their message. It marks the first successful communication between humans and this mysterious intelligent life form from the ocean. Samantha plans to adjust the sound wave frequency to form an image, hoping YRR can understand and respond. While filming near the small exploration vessel, Elena sees a flash in the water. Suddenly, the ship loses power, plunging into darkness. When power returns, Elena is found unconscious by the pool. Cecile examines her in the medical room and discovers cerebrospinal fluid leaking from her nose, suggesting brain trauma. As Cecile treats Elena, Samantha informs the captain and Sigur that a low-frequency sound was detected during the blackout. The sound came from inside the ship, leaving everyone stunned. Could YRR have boarded their vessel? Elena's condition worsens, with strange bruises appearing on her body. Cecile performs a lumbar puncture to check for infection. The test results show that some of Elena's nerve cells contain the same substance as the infected marine life. Cecile suspects the substance is trying to fuse with her cells, just as it controls other aquatic life, taking over her nerve system. This confirms that Elena had close contact with YRR. Charlie recalls the light display near the small exploration vessel. YRR may have followed it aboard. Sigur suggests sealing off the small exploration vessel's compartment to prevent further danger. Samantha proposes a new idea. Just as humans send images when searching for extraterrestrial life, they should send an evolutionary image to YRR. Since both humans and YRR evolved from the ocean, they might share a common past. Samantha creates a sound wave image depicting human evolution and transmits it to the seabed. Charlie checks the pool in the lower compartment and notices a strange glow. The light transforms into various forms of marine life, no longer a blur. Leon and Samantha receive a response from YRR and are shocked to see a detailed image. YRR has understood and sent back a map of the Earth's continental plates from 250 million years ago, demonstrating its intelligence and ability to comprehend human communication. A helicopter lands on the ship and Mifune steps out. Sigur shows him footage from the pool, revealing a unique single-celled organism that can move, change shape, and combine into a multicellular form. Samantha presents the image of humanity's evolution from the ocean to land and the ancient continental plate map. YRR appears to remember Earth's state from 250 million years ago through genetic collective memory. Charlie believes this is a YRR message indicating they have lived on Earth far longer than humans. Even if humans evolved from the ocean and may share a common ancestor with YRR, it doesn't mean YRR will let them harm the sea. Sigur thinks YRR is trying to communicate, but Elena, the only human to have made direct contact, is still in a coma. Cecile advises against further contact but Charlie argues that YRR entered Elena's body not to kill, but to understand humans. YRR may not have known humans were intelligent until now. Leon suggests sending the sounds of a humpback whale calf to YRR. He recalls how humans banned humpback whale hunting in the 1960s when their population neared extinction. Since then, their numbers have rebounded to 25,000, showing humanity's capacity for change. He hopes this message will resonate with YRR. Mifune then informs the captain that a massive tsunami has just devastated the Nigerian coastline, 
causing countless casualties. The first officer, who is Nigerian, is shattered by the news of his flooded hometown. Meanwhile, Cecile experiments with the pool water samples in the lab and discovers that ketamine, a pain medication, can kill YR cells. While humans need high doses, YR cells die from minimal exposure. Mifune asks if this can be used against YR outside the lab. Cecile explains that she has only tested small amounts and needs further research. Mifune's assistant suggests testing in the pool as it provides a contained environment. Sigur interrupts, shocked, questioning if they are considering killing YRR just after establishing communication. The captain mentions the West African tsunami, implying it might have been caused by YRR, raising the tension between the need for defense and the hope for peaceful understanding. Sigur warns that killing YRR could devastate marine life, leading to humanity's extinction. As tensions rise, Mifune suggests that showing YRR humans have a powerful weapon could give them leverage for negotiation. Cecile agrees to test the ketamine, considering it a potential strategic weapon. Samantha and Leon support the idea of prioritizing the survival of humanity. Charlie feels conflicted. She believes YRR means no harm and only wants to understand humans, but she has no proof. Fully protected, Cecile drops a single drop of ketamine into the pool. The YRR cells become visible, and lights on the ship start flickering. In horror, the crew watches large water spheres rise from the pool, emitting a piercing sound like YRR's cries of anguish. The ship is plunged into darkness. Cecile wakes up to find Luther lying unconscious in the pool. All power systems are down, and a glowing mass of light surrounds the ship. The captain realizes they are not just adrift, but being pulled by YR. Samantha thinks War's dying screams have summoned a retaliatory force. The captain considers pouring ketamine into the sea, but Sigur laughs, saying it's impossible. Killing a few YRR in the pool has already caused chaos. The vast ocean contains over 13.5 million cubic kilometers of water, and using enough ketamine to destroy YRR is unfeasible and catastrophic. The team realizes that trying to intimidate YRR has backfired. The only solution is to make peace. But with the ship's power down, Samantha cannot send the sound wave images. Seeger proposes a daring plan. Charlie should pilot the underwater vessel, take the deceased Luther's body into the deep sea, and inject YRR cells into his chest. By replicating how YRR tried to bond with Elena, they hope to convey a message of peaceful coexistence. The ship is being dragged toward an iceberg by the enraged YRR. More icebergs close in, threatening to trap them. The crew's only hope is Charlie in the underwater exploration vessel. As she descends, YR surrounds her. Charlie doubts using the dead Luther will work and decides to inject the YR cells into herself. She believes YR will sense her goodwill and spare her. Removing her headset, she prepares for the risky move. Charlie enters the airlock, injects the YRR cells into her chest, and lets seawater flood in. Fear grips her, knowing the pressure could kill her. The crew fears the worst, thinking she has perished. But then, a vibrant light display appears, unlocking the hatch and freeing Charlie. Surrounded by glowing lights, she floats as they enter her body. Back on the ship, the crew sees the icebergs drifting away. It seems Charlie's message of peace has been received. Despite losing her father to the sea, Charlie has always loved and dedicated herself to understanding the ocean. Later, a white figure washes ashore. It's Charlie, and she opens her eyes. But it's unclear if she is still human or something new. However, we notice that her eye color has changed from her original gray to her current blue. This can only be revealed in the next season. This concludes the season's recap. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to our channel, click the bell, and select all for more thrilling recaps. See you in the next video.